Well, with your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2, I just want to begin by coming alongside Pastor Tim and asking the Lord for his blessing upon our time. So come with me in prayer to the Lord. Father in heaven, we come before you in Christ's name. And it was the words of your son when he said, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts, will not the Father give his Holy Spirit to those who ask? Father, we do ask for your Holy Spirit this morning to invade this meeting, to empower the Word. Lord, only you can do this work, and so we ask you for Christ's sake. Amen. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, verse 14 through 21 will be our text today, so that you can add that before you. But I want to start by just helping our minds to think about the subject by taking your attention to the modern times, to our current societal context, to the generation that we live and everything that's happening outside the, the walls of this church today, the 21st century. If you're keeping tabs, uh, if you're, you're watching the news, if you're, you're keeping track of the government situation and the new decisions that come down the line and the latest agenda and, and, and movement of society, I tell you, and I know I don't need to tell you in many ways, it's not hard to feel low, is it? It's not hard. To, to be brought down low and, and at times lose hope when it seems like every new announcement from every news source, even reputable, uh, is a negative announcement, right? One more advancement of, of Satan's movements, his dominion, his, his works in the world. Our society, brothers and sisters, it's, it's no... <laughs> It's obvious, it continues to plummet lower and lower and lower into sin, doesn't it? Lower and lower into egregious evil. The possibility of more government overreach, LGBTQ plus movement advancing and advancing, digital IDs, one world government, abortion, even on the rise at times, right? These and other different updates, whatever it might be, you can fill in the blank this morning, can certainly bring us low. Can certainly bring us low. And I know many of you have completely, as a result, put news out of your life, right? Cut off all ties to the constant updates. Unsubscribe from every possible news source so that you can, you can get away from the stress because it's so much. It feels like it's every day. It's too much to handle, and in many, many, many ways, I absolutely resonate with that. It certainly can be. Maybe that's your avenue. Maybe your avenue is, is storing up for what's going to happen, right? Stocking up. Whatever it might be, loading your basement with as much food because you see the trajectory, and it's not good. Or may, maybe it's just, well, I'm, I'm hightailing it out of here. I'm, I'm moving. I'm, I'm getting as far away to Timbuktu as possible from what I see that's coming on the horizon. Now, I don't need to elaborate much more on that. I know we all know when we think about society where it's at. But with all the news of escalating evil, beloved, all the news of rampant wickedness and licentiousness in our culture, the impending uncertainty of the future, I want to argue this morning something pertinent from Scripture for you. It's that we are still living in an incredibly privileged time. An incredible time. One that you have to but stop and think about from the text that we're going to look out today. Oh, well, there's many. But this morning, I want to bring you to that encouragement from the Lord that you live in an incredible generation. You live in an incredible time. By the mercies of God, there are glorious and eternal privileges that we stand in today. And that scripture is going to prove that for us today and remind us. So my encouragement to you is to Realize the incredible honored position that you occupy in the time today that you live in. And because of what I'm going to look at today, because of the most glorious work brought about by God 
through the Holy Spirit. God sending the third member of the Trinity to us. And beloved, I hope that will be your encouragement today. And so I, as we begin to examine our text, this is, this is the brunt of what I want us to look at today. Still thinking about Pentecost, and I'll explain that with you, but Pentecost bringing about an incredible promise prophesied ages beforehand where God would be working in the lives of his people like never, never before. An incredible time. And in the prophecy we'll look at, spoken of by Peter, we're going to find this promise of God realized, not, not simply just for the church at that time period, but spanning into today. So if you're with me still, I want to take you back to the last time I preached, because we were looking at Pentecost. There's only a difference in my title by a couple words. We did look at Pentecost itself from Acts 2, 1 through 13. We looked at exactly what happened when the Spirit came and and filled God's people that were gathered with a miraculous gift of of languages spoken perfectly so that others could understand it. Speaking of the mighty works of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and, and this bewildered gathering of Jews that didn't know how to respond to what was happening. We looked at that last time, but this morning we're going to look at Peter's response to that same multitude. His moment of preaching, bringing the word, a response to them that have no idea what's happening before them, these awestruck people, in what is, at least the beginning of what we'll examine today, the very first Christian sermon. Very first Christian sermon post Christ's resurrection. And so Peter here, full of the Holy Spirit, seizes the incredible opportunity brought about by God's Spirit coming to speak, to give an answer to people that witnessed this incredible movement of God. And to point them to God in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're only going to look at the introduction of the sermon. I'm so excited that we're, we're here finally. Uh, but I just want to take that beginning part because Peter has more to say. And this part we'll look at today is specifically on Joel's prophecy. That prophecy ages ago told the event that was unfolding before the eyes of this gathered people. Planned, preordained through scripture. And so let's turn our eyes to the pages of Holy Scripture together. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 starting in verse 14. Follow along with me to verse 21. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams." Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls Upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So at the outset of our text this morning, we have Peter addressing the crowd in what is a bold, strong, authoritative appeal. Right? An answer to what was just going on before their eyes. Peter stands up. This this once, and mind you, this once as we've looked at, timid, afraid, Apostle of Christ, even unfaithful to him, right now clothed in the power, anointed in the Holy Spirit, standing among the other apostles to proclaim the word of God. Speaking and preaching with an otherworldly passion, as he says. It says in verse 14, Peter standing with the eleven, he lifts up his voice and addresses the men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Let this be known to you. Give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. 
lifting up his voice in unction, commanding the attention of all those standing by and listening, saying, let not a man among you turn his ear away. Turn not aside for a moment. Harness your attention, folk, to what I'm about to say to you. Do not miss, and woe to those that would miss the preaching of God's word. This incredible opportunity. Peter beseeching, not just to lend a a mere subtle attention to the words, but to take the very faculty of your hearing and submit it to what I'm about to say. Peter commanding their attention. And what I love here, in the same Holy Spirit strength, Peter is demanding the attention further by brushing aside their vain attempts to absolutely discredit what was happening among them. Put it aside, bury it in the ground, To those who are thinking that it's nothing more than drunkenness, because if you note, verse 12 and 13, and they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But look at this little group, but others were mocking, saying they are filled with new wine. Peter, again, not only gives a bold appeal, but brushes off apologetically those attempts to invalidate it. Those who think it's just a spectacle of drunkenness, Peter boldly approaches and addresses them that, no, that comment is mere stupidity, right? How dare you, in a sense? Drunkards were not even found in these numbers to such an extent, and certainly not as early as 9 a.m., right? And certainly not, oh, those who hear me, certainly not with the ability to fluently speak so many languages that everyone can hear the words of God being preached, And I love, and I put it in here because I love it, Alexander, or J.A. Alexander, he's a 19th century theologian, put it this way. This is not intoxication, but inspiration. So lend your ear. And I appreciate how God and the Holy Spirit inspired these words because it even includes the very posture of the 11 apostles plus 12, or 12 apostles here, the posture of them with Peter, they stood Standing with the 11. Standing. What were once these limp, foolish, fearful men now boldly stand with no apology before a people and proclaim God's word. They're not half-hearted anymore. They're absolutely unflinchingly confident about the word of God through what the Spirit's done. And I want us to think before we do go to the prophecy of Joel, I want to think about the pattern this sets for preaching, for preaching on on the Lord's day, preaching in general. Preaching is, is not mere dialogue. It's not mere chatter. It's not mere discussion or argument, right? On the Lord's day, it's none of those. It's the word of God being brought to people. It's God's holy word. It's his breath speaking out. It's his inspired truth to you, the hearers, to me. Of what God has for us. God's truth. Matters of eternal consequence are being proclaimed. Christ, uh, our, our salvation is being offered unto you. God is speaking through the scriptures even this morning to you. This is preaching. So bring your necessary attention. Give all, beloved, to its hearing. Give all to the word of God. Listen as if you knew today was your last day to live. This is the word of God. And no excuses, petty excuses, I mind you, to refuse the authenticity of the word are not going to endure the scrutiny, the scrutiny of, of even just pure logic, God's truth, or Christ's ultimate judgment. And so come and listen. Come and listen. Now from Peter's here initial authoritative appeal comes his direct and and divinely inspired address of the events of Pentecost itself. That's what we're going to devote the rest of our time to. Where he seeks to bring captive that audience that witnessed the movement of God. This silenced, bewildered crowd to what was happening and why. And Peter answers them and points it to God himself. You want to know why this happened? You want to know where it came from? Look no further than to God himself. It was as quoted in the scripture. Rooting Pentecost here in what was foretold ages ago and foretold through the mouth of Joel. So let's look at this prophecy one more time together. 
Verse 16 starts it where Peter says, but this, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so we have the prophecy quoted from Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32. And, and really what we're going to do this morning is, is cut that in half and look at both of its sections. Firstly, we're going to see Pentecost marked the manifold arrival of the Spirit of God. And if you're following with me your notes or your handout, that's the first point. Pentecost marked the manifold arrival of the Spirit of God. And secondly, Pentecost also marked the coming judgment of God. So we'll be looking at these together. Firstly, Pentecost marked the manifold arrival of the Spirit of God. Peter says, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. What you're seeing before you today is is what God had prophesied long ago and pre-planned and pre-purposed now to take place in your midst. The very unfolding of God's outpouring predicted. What God had spoken through Joel now manifested and it was the giving of the Spirit that is the primary focus of that very prophecy. Narrow in with me folks on that. It's it's not just, and we're so tempted to look at the little details here of, of well, it's, it's that they would prophesy, it's that they would see visions, it's that we would dream, dream dreams. We're going to look at that, but that's not the main focus. What the main focus of this text brings us to is the great and manifold giving of the Spirit of God. So don't miss that this morning as we look at it. The Spirit of God, the outpouring of the Spirit, this extraordinary work of God brought about here and prophesied long ago. And as Joel writes here, and as Peter quotes, in the last days. Okay, so verse 14, Peter standing with the, oh, sorry, not verse 14, verse 17. And in the last days, it shall be, God declares that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, there's a lot of confusion about what that means. Okay, last days, what age are we talking about? Is that that much more to come? Well, we would understand based upon what we're seeing and what Peter says about the prophet Joel uttering what's happening now, these last days are what's happening now. The manifold work of the Spirit of God was one more marker in the ministry of the Messiah, God's Son, that inaugurated the, the, what we might call the final stretch of history. The last days since Jesus Christ came. And Pentecost signaled Those last days being brought about from Christ and until the day that he would return in his second coming. And this is not unusual language. The last days now since Christ is all throughout the New Testament. Because Peter later on quotes in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 20. He says, he speaking of Jesus was foreknown before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in the last times. For the sake of you. Note that. And one more quote. Hebrews 1. Verses 1 and 2. It says. Long ago at many times and in many ways. God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days. He has spoken to us by his son. So notice that. The last days brought about in Jesus Christ's coming. Spanning from from this very moment with Pentecost. And brought about through all the ministry of Christ. Until Christ would come back and even stretching into our own day. There's a sense in which we could say today we're in the last days through Christ. So as we consider the promises which were materialized for them, note, brothers and sisters, those same promises for us this morning. Now from the text that we can observe and remember we're under that heading about the manifold work of the Spirit, I want us to to look at the words of the text and find out, okay, well what exactly was so incredibly manifold about this coming of the Spirit of God? 
And I want to look at four things. It was manifold in marking an impartial inclusion. An impartial inclusion. inclusion. 17 and 18 says, In those days it shall be, God declares, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male servants and female servants in those days I'll pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Impartial inclusion of the church of Christ. Pentecost was the spirit of God given to all his people. All his people. All the church. Joel was referring to the people of God and their experience, right? As as if to connect the intimacy of the church saying, yours, your sons, right? Your daughters, your young men, your old men. They're all going to prophesy. They're all going to experience what is the inclusion in the spirit of God being poured out impartially. The Spirit of God would be given to all the body of Christ here, beloved, without, without distinction. This is lovely. God's presence wouldn't just simply dwell with kings. It wouldn't just simply dwell just in the temple with priests or even just the apostles. Right? God's Spirit would abide with each and every member of his elect that would come to him by faith. Each and every member of the body of Christ. So this is from the highest and the lowest, regardless of societal rank, status, age, or nobility. All Christ's blood-bought bride would experience the Spirit of God coming upon them. And they'd know that through salvation. They'd share in the experience of the presence of the living God. Now I pause just for a moment on that note. And if I may gather the attention of the children here for just one moment. Especially now, children, tune your attention to this truth as the word of God is so clear and something for you is so specially applied. The Bible says you're not too young to experience the mercy and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not too young to know the presence of the living God through the mercy that comes through the gospel. Ask yourself the question, young friends, why is it that my mom and dad bring me to church? Why is it that I come with them each and every week? You're not, you're not just an accessory. You need the word of God. Children, you need to hear God's truth because what the Bible tells us today is the spirit is for all flesh that come to him by faith. You're not too young for the word of God. You're not too young to experience the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. And I ask you children today, as you listen to me, do you know the mercy of God? Do you know the presence of God that comes about in salvation? Do you know forgiveness of Jesus Christ? Think on this. Impartial inclusion means all. That's the first point I want us to look at in the manifold giving of the Spirit of God and impartial inclusion. Now, with that reality, Peter explains from Joel that Pentecost also marked a manifold, or sorry, it was manifold in marking a new intimacy with God. Okay, a new intimacy with God. I'll pour out my spirit, he says, on all flesh. I'll pour it out in abundance. We've seen the evidence of that even in the happenings of Pentecost. It signaled, beloved, a a new era in the story of redemptive history. A brand new page had been turned over with Jesus Christ coming. And we see that here. A development in the interactions of the living God with his people would be brought about here. And Joel's prophecy is alluding to, to what was prophesied about the new covenant. When God would make a great and glorious change with his people, it would be inaugurated in the blood of Christ and it would be signal forth the new covenant in the coming of the spirit of Pentecost. As you have your Bibles on your lap, turn with me to the Old Testament in Ezekiel 36. We're going to look at this glorious promise prophesied in another place. 
where it talks a little bit more about the specifics of the effect. Ezekiel 36. Now I just want to read a few chunks. Firstly, in 36, verse 25 to 27, follow along with me. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I'll give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Now jump ahead to chapter 37 and read 26 to 28 with me. God says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will set them in their land and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. Oh, praise God. That sanctuary in the people brought about in Pentecost and now continuing today. The new covenant. Not only would God impartially include the entirety of his bride in Christ in this very outpouring that we see, but he would dwell personally with his people in a manner in which he had not in the old covenant. Note that he had not. And in the new covenant, that much better. The holy presence of God, what was once inaccessible by means of the temple veil, what, what, what those priests would only be able to come into once per year with the blood on the mercy seat, now had been torn from top to bottom in Christ's death opening up the very intimate portions of God's holy presence to his bride, his people. And all the radiant nearness of God was brought about through Jesus Christ. Have you ever thought about that when you pray? (laughs) Have you thought about that? The access to God that you have through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit abiding with you in Jesus I, I picture, and it, it makes it so clear in my mind, what with God's people, it's as if they were those who stood at the bottom of, of a dam beyond measure of water, looking for, for the remnants of just trickling, trickling movements of water at the bottom, wherever they could get it, and it was lovely to have. But yet in the new covenant, it's as though the dam has been broke in half, the torrent floods forth, and people have access to constant torrents of God's holy presence. And this is the, this is the, the, the reality that we dwell in. The reality that they did and us. At Pentecost, the church would experience the abundant indwelling of the Holy Spirit coming forth to reside in them with, with, with a greater frequency, power, and with permanence. Note that, permanence. They would, and so would every future generation of Christians, experience his nearness. They'd be assured of their salvation in Christ. They'd be enabled in the great commission work of preaching the gospel. Enabled to do it. And even as we read in Ezekiel 36, they'd be cleansed of their fallen nature, their inclination to sin in a manner in which they had never had before. They would be God's people. He would be their God. And this is what we see in Pentecost. Christ working in them and would always be with them. So manifold in a great new and intimacy with God. Now, they... And, and, and future Christians would be blessed to experience future outpourings of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost, note, as we come to the third portion, talking about the manifold work of the Holy Spirit, Pentecost, Pentecost was manifold in that it marked an entire age of glorious outpourings. And if you're keeping track, that's on your handout too. An entire age of glorious outpourings. God's spirit would come and come and come. This is not an isolated season in the timeline of God's acts. 
Right? As we look at the word, as prophet Joel says, in those days, I'll pour out my spirit. Not, not just in that day, Amen. right? In those days. We, we, we would be promised as the church would to look forward to, pray for, and expect even further outpourings of the Spirit of God from heaven. As the Lord would break open the floodgates of heaven and pour into his people until they'd be overflowing. A time unlike any time before it, God promised it coming, coming. Christian, note it, coming. Pentecost's to experience in the presence of God. We would now have the permanent presence of the Holy Spirit and we could look forward to what is now called in many ways revivals ongoing throughout the seasons of the church in history. And that's why we pray. Pray for that very reality. That the Pentecost would come, revive his people, longing for more of him and awaken. Awaken as happens right here in this context. Awaken more people from death into life in Christ. Now, with that end in mind, as I think about Pentecost coming, the Spirit coming in fullness, and even greater measure in times to come, for the purpose of gospel preaching and its effective preaching in the hearts of men, Peter makes us aware that it was manifold in marking a time of powerful confirmations in the works of God. So note that with me. Pentecost was manifold in marking a time of powerful confirmations in the works of God. Let's just look at verse 17 and 18 one more time. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Repeat it again. The last days brought in Jesus Christ would be a time in which God was bearing witness to the authenticity of his work, the reality, the truthfulness of his work by means of supernatural manifestations, incredible manifestations of God and his descending upon the people at Pentecost, just as was prophesied, the Lord would prove to those gathered the reality of what was happening and what was being said. We've seen that tongues were given. Languages were poured out upon the people of God. They were able to speak fluently in the languages of those that were around them about the mighty works of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. They had this gift given to them to bear witness of the truthfulness of what they were proclaiming. The gospel of Christ. And now here, with what Peter describes, prophecy the speaking forth of God's glorious revelations and what's revealed in the word and even what's future, dreams, visions would likewise be granted to God's people to again, the same purpose, bear powerful witness to the genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the new covenant. Now, I say that because I'm sure your minds are wondering what does it mean for us today? We occupy, and I would argue, we occupy a unique position Within the last days, as those who, who, who have the fullness of God's revelation in our hands. That wasn't necessarily the truth that, of those that stood there and bore witness to those events we're speaking of. There's a real sense in which I believe such verifications would not be normative in the same way as they would have originally been for those in that context. For those in the early church, there, there didn't exist the same impetus for those, for, for us today because they, they didn't have the fullness of scripture actually wrote, whereas we do today. And I think Hebrews chapter 2 verse 3 through 4 gives us a bit of that evidence when it says, it was declared at first, speaking of the message of salvation, it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Did you catch that? That, that these miracles would, would be an, a sign to approve of and give attestation to the works of God in these similar outpourings in the preaching of the gospel. Now, does that mean that that... that 
God can never and will never do things like that again? I'm not here to say that. No. God can do mighty things. And I think he certainly can. But a better question that I think we can ask of this text is does it mean that God has ceased to testify miraculously to his works in the preaching of the gospel? Not at all. Not at all. Even manifold more, never. The Lord continues to display manifold testimonies, signs to his gospel in bringing lost sinners to repentance in Christ. I would argue that far greater, far more manifold, far more incredible than mere prophecy, visions, or dreams is that a soul, a broken sinner comes to Jesus Christ by faith. The impossibility of salvation for one who opposes the worship of God to come. Oh, indeed, brothers and sisters, the Lord is still verifying the preaching of the gospel and the movements of the Spirit. He may very well do similar realities where revelation is not very accessible, but still, brothers and sisters, we are witnesses to glorious works of God today. And I would say we even occupy a position of one of greater benefit today and even greater expectation. Now, as we looked at parts and parcels of of the Spirit of God being poured out at Pentecost, You'll notice, and I'm sure you did as we read it, the prophecy of Joel takes what is kind of an interesting turn. From from talking about the outpouring of the Spirit, what was once the biblical founding of, of an outpouring in Pentecost, now to a warning. Now to a warning of a, of a great and momentous day to come. The Spirit had come, and with it, blessings for the church, blessings for his people, that men would turn from their sin and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, yet with that promise, another promise of a coming day with eternal penal implications, eternal wrathful justice, ve- vengeance implications. Joel's prophecy predicted a time which marked an incredible movement of God's spirit. It did. And, and with that same marker, Another witness of a judgment that was soon to come and soon to arrive. So let's look at at this aspect of the prophecy together. Starting in verse 19 down through 21. It says, And, in addition to what is spoken about in Pentecost, And I will show my wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We now come to the second portion of the prophecy, which is that Pentecost marked the coming judgment of God. Pentecost was a marker of the vengeance of God. And a judgment, a specific judgment that would be dealt upon Israel in particular in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Mark that, but with that judgment, it typified a final day of reckoning when God would come in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. These last days were brought about in Christ as the spirit came in abundance. We looked at that. The same last days here spoken of in the judgment of God. A time in which the Lord was materializing all of his promises spoke about in these prophecies. And the kingdoms advanced through the spirit coming at Pentecost. Yet just as God, just as God would be faithful to his word about the spirit coming. He would be faithful to keep it in regard to a faithless people that Christ had sought to gather in. As a hen gathers up its chicks. Right? A great and magnificent day of the Lord for the Jews was looming on the horizon in the text that's spoken of here. Luke 19, 41 to 44. The same author of Acts. Speaking of Jesus, it says, And when he drew near and saw the city, Jerusalem, he wept over it saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. 
but know that they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. In the bringing about of Pentecost, Peter was warning the Jews gathered at that same event of the impending day spoken above by Christ. A day that Christ had even told his disciples about, saying of the temple specifically in Matthew 24 too, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. A horrible judgment was coming. And in that judgment, when the destruction of the temple would come, the abolishment of the old covenant sacrifices would go away. Symbols were there. No longer would there be the priesthood. These shadows and types would be moved aside for new covenant worship. Right? And with that, the recompense of Christ, the recompense of God against a wicked nation that refused its Messiah and even handed him over for death because they said they had no king but Caesar. Here would be the judgment of Christ upon a nation that refused him. And the prophet Joel spoke so very clearly to those who would remain unrepentant. And notice, notice, just as prophecy, just as visions, just as dreams would bear witness in the spirit for the arrival of the third member of the Trinity, so too would manifestations of God's wrath come and bear witness to the coming wrath of God against Israel and against the temple. Christ alluded to these realities even when the, the disciples themselves asked Christ, what will the sign be on that day? And he says, wars and rumors of wars, nations rising against nation, famines, earthquakes, the beginnings of birth pains, a great tribulation in Matthew 24. And this was a thought process of the men of old, and I picked Matthew Henry as he has helpful words to describe the meaning of some of the language in the symbols given. When Matthew Henry says of the temple's destruction, the blood points at the wars of the Jews with the neighboring nations, with the Samaritans, Syrians, and Greeks, in which abundance of blood was shed. As there was also in their civil wars and the struggles of the seditious, as they called them, which were very bloody. There was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in. The fire and vapor of smoke here foretold literally came to pass in the burning of their cities and towns and synagogues and temple at last. And this turning of the sun into darkness and the moon into blood speaks of the disillusion of their government, civil and sacred, and the extinguishing of all their lights. A great day of the Lord loomed on the horizon of unrepentant Israel, and it was warned of in the text, the same last days. But notice, notice even to them, even to unrepentant Israel, there was yet a promise tacked on to the end. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's mercy at Pentecost to the Jews here in the gospel message was outstretched that they would preserve their own souls and come to the Lord. Come to the Messiah that came to save them. Come, come to the Christ that came to redeem them. To flee, to flee unto God while there was still time. To heed the works of God and the Spirit as a bold sign and a witness of God's coming judgment for them. To call upon Christ and find salvation. And turn upon the one that they traded over to crucifixion. Well, what about us? Right? What about us from the text that we've looked at? A prophecy so distant and, and, and a prophecy fulfilled in the spirit and a coming judgment. There's a lot here for us to process. There's a lot here for our own day. There's a lot here for their day. But I believe there's much that we can take home from this text. And as we come close to a close, I want us to consider two things. Okay, just two things. Firstly, I want you to consider God's judgment. I want you to consider God's judgment today. 
We've been given a stark picture of it, even in part for Israel, but consider the coming vengeance of God. Like the Jews were brought to the reality of God's vengeance in Pentecost as we've looked at here, so too are we. So too are we. It's the same last days. Same last days spanning into our time today. A time is coming, friends, a time is coming in like manner to what the prophet Joel spoke of, but infinitely greater. Infinitely and more vast More awful, if you might say, depending on the perspective. A greater degree. Because Joel spoke of the judgment that was directly ahead for Israel. Directly ahead for the Jews. But but what was reflected in those words were, were a point and a direction even to what would come in Jesus Christ. The direct fulfillment would be in the Jews. But we can grasp a picture of one judgment to come when the Son of Man will come in the clouds. And a sword from his mouth will slay the wicked. A great recompense spoke of in scripture. A magnificent and great day. To borrow the language that we see here in Joel. In which Christ will return. Not to redeem. But to judge. To condemn. And listen to the words of Revelation 6. 12 through 17. Of this great day. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Who can stand? Who can stand when Christ comes in judgment? Who can hide from the vengeance of Christ to those who willfully neglect his gospel? There's a reminder here for the leaders of our nation. There's a reminder here to to those in authority that they'll stand account to the king that they mocked or set themselves against. So why Psalm 2 says, kiss the son, lest you perish in the way. What an end. None who neglect Christ. The vengeance of the Lord is coming. And I tell you, friends, there will be no escape for those who do not come to him by faith. No hiding. No rock, no mountain, no quiet place that you can hide from the seeking vengeance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Does his gospel, does his death on the cross not give us a blatant picture about the sole sufficiency of his death, the exclusivity of his gospel for salvation? There's no other means. And Christ will come to those who have turned a blind eye to his gospel. You can't hide under rocks. You can't hide under church membership. You can't hide under parents that, that, that believe the gospel. You can't hide in your baptism. You can't hide that you've been coming and gathering. None of these will be sufficient means to save you when Christ comes. None. You'll be stripped of all and Christ will find out every. And the question that we have to consider today is where, 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 where are you going to stand on that day? Where are you going to stand when Christ comes with this power? Are you in Christ today? And I plead with you, give all your attention to that question. Give all your attention to that question. Where are you? And further consider, you who do not know Jesus Christ here today, the witness against you in the movements of God around you. Hear that word, the witness against you in the movements of God around you. 
Right? Pentecost was a sign that the Spirit had come. It was a visible manifestation of God working in his people. And so too was it an evidence of a coming judgment of God that was inescapable. A movement, a manifestation that God indeed has a gospel that saves and to neglect it is damnation. If you're an unregenerate person and you have seen Christians be made, if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ and you've watched somebody go from a sinner, unregenerate, broken, lost, to having salvation in Jesus Christ, if you watch them grow in the gospel, if you've seen people come, if you've seen, if you've tasted of the benefits of church, then let these stand as a witness against you today. Let these stand as a witness and a sign against you that God is indeed moving and his son is the only way of salvation. If you have watched, if I may get as intimately as I can on this, if you've watched this church, other churches persevere through the last two years, you've watched a people stand where by other means it would be impossible. You've been shocked by this work and yet you have not come to Christ. Heed, heed, heed the movement of the spirit in God's people as a sign, as a witness that God will judge. And heed it, not just as a witness of God's judgment, but as a sign of his mercy to you. As an outstretched arm that you might not perish but have eternal life. An urging, brothers and sisters, and an urging to those who don't know Jesus to come unto the Lord and be saved. Come unto the Lord. Understand, these are a mercy to you that you might, in beholding the visible manifestations of God and his people... Come to Christ and see your desperate need to have him and be saved. Or, or the witness of God's work can be a curse to you. They will be a curse to you. The witness of God's working will stand upon or stand up in the day of judgment and attest against you. That you had opportunity and you pushed it aside. Consider the mercy of God. Because the day of the Lord is only glorious, only glorious, only magnificent, and only great to those who know Jesus Christ. It's only a great day for them. And it will be the greatest day for them. But it will be a day of horror to those who refuse Christ. And so we have the same promise. The same promise for the Jews that heard that gospel preached. For them is, is today. Today. Call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. Find salvation in Jesus. Can he not save? All who call a glorious invite to the lost, the neglectful of the gospel, the refusers of his constant proddings of mercy. Here you have opportunity. Flee into Christ and be saved. Cry out to God for his mercy. This promise, and if I could pick one, is just one of the ones that is just stands out as so wondrous. By the mere calling, seeking, pleading with God to do a work, he does. And so come, come by faith. Take a hold of this promise as if it's the end of your life. If you don't know Jesus today, that promise is for you. Secondly, consider the judgment of God. Consider the activity of the Spirit. Consider the activity of the Spirit. The wonderful, gracious, merciful activity and joyous activity of the Spirit. Pentecost marks an incredible time for the church today, beloved. An incredible time. God is dwelling with his people intimately and permanently. In a way as we looked at, he did not before. He fills us with the incredible knowledge of his will. He, he equips us for the gospel by giving us the power we need to preach it. He, he, he guides us in hating our own sin and making war at it. He gives us the strength to pray, the strength to fight, the strength to persevere. And he reminds us that he's always with us. He reminds us that he's never going to leave us or forsake us. And even when we don't feel the presence of Christ in the Holy Spirit, we're promised that he's with us always. That we 
as temples of the Holy Spirit. Abide with him and he abides with us forever. Do you see, Christian, the privilege of your time? Do you see the immense privilege and honor it is to occupy your position, your period throughout all history? To have the Holy Spirit with you. Considering the activity of the Holy Spirit and even in relation to what we looked at in Pentecost and what it means, I'd ask you the question, to what extent do you see the Holy Spirit's work in your life? To what extent do you see The work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Ask yourself this question. And I'm not talking about prophecy. I'm not talking about dreams necessarily. But what the text was pointing to. To what extent do you know the daily obvious enablement of the Holy Spirit? To what extent do you see even greater and greater manifestations of his working in your life as a Christian? Ongoing, continual. Are you living in such a way that the realities of Pentecost are on display in your life? Is is there an assurance of your salvation as, as the Spirit testifies to your heart that you're a child of God and you reply, Abba, Father? Is this a work in your life? Do you have what would be known as a grievous, continuous conviction against the sin that still abides in your heart. And you hate it. You want to put it further into the grave. And do you love the body of Christ? Do you love to gather with God's people? Do you love to be in the house of the Lord? Do you have a fervor for the gospel? Do you have an enablement to preach it? Do you have a power, a fervency, even a boldness? Oh, I'm not, t- I'm not, not here to say that none of us are, are, are fearless when we share Christ. But do you know something of the Holy Spirit's working in your life when you do share the Spirit? The urgings, the necessity, the desire that people must know Jesus? Do you know the Holy Spirit's presence? Do you know his power? Do you know his nearness? I pray, I pray you know these realities. I pray you see the necessity of the Spirit, even for gospel proclamation, for the glory of Christ that we've seen in Pentecost, because these, these are our realities, beloved. These are our realities today. Cherish them, cherish them deeply. Worship God for them. Find a great joy in the period you occupy Find a great joy that Christ dwells with us in his Holy Spirit as the comforter. Yearn for greater and greater outpourings of the Holy Spirit in your life. Pray that you might have rain from heaven upon your life. That God might rend the heavens and work in your life through the Holy Spirit. That you might have greater effusions of his mercy. Do you long, for that matter, do we long? Do you and do we long as a church for greater fillings of the Holy Spirit? Oh, this was the language of old. This was the language of God's people throughout the centuries, beloved. Do you long for greater fillings? The book of Acts is going to keep putting this before our faces. Keep putting before our faces the need of the Holy Spirit. The need of more of the Holy Spirit. The need to walk closely with the Lord. And more of more of him in our kingdom ministry, not necessarily just more and more of busyness, but more and more of the Holy Spirit, more and more of the enablement to do all that we need to do as Christians. It's too bad because, you know, much of the church today is very reactionary. I've heard Paul Washer say this many times. Much of the church is very, very reactionary to the Holy Spirit. Which is to say that because there's so much euphoria, because there's so much just feeling and and unnecessary things happening in the church in the name of the Holy Spirit today, we go the other way. We go so far. The pendulum goes all the way to the point where we don't even need to talk much about the Holy Spirit. That's just one period. It's not as important for us today. We, we, don't want to, we don't want to confirm euphoria, but, but then we negate the biblical significance of the Holy Spirit in our life and ongoing empowerments. 
And this is so sad. Because we're talking about God. We're talking about a member of the triune God. And his necessity for our life and our walk and our gospel proclamation and all that we do as Christians. And you look throughout the pages of history and Christians knew this so much that they prayed with their whole life. Some pray 24-7, continuous tracts of Christians all throughout the day praying that God would give us more. Give us more, Lord. Give us more of your spirit. We're so thirsty. We can't make it. We have no power in the gospel ministry. We want to see souls saved for Christ and so come. Oh, that was the plea of the church and I pray it's our plea. Because I'm not advertising, no, and don't get me wrong, I'm not advertising to you some higher life theology, right? Some sinless state. No, no, no. But folks, I, I bet, I bet there are a great many of you that know what it's like when you meet a fellow Christian in the Lord who scares you because it seems like they walk so closely with the Lord. It seems like they walk so closely that every word comes out, that scripture, and you so greatly wonder, oh, how have you grown so close to the Lord? And I submit there are men and women through history who seek this very promise so fervently that it's theirs. And I pray that we wouldn't just know fractionary amounts of Christians who, in a sense, are almost living embodiments of the Holy Spirit because Christ dwells so close to them. I pray that would be us, us, that we would desire more of him and our prayer would be give, oh Lord, give us greater manifestations of your spirit. Give us greater and greater. We're thirsty. We're not content. We want more. We want more. And so this is both a call to rejoice in the incredible work God has done in the Spirit, church, as well as an urging to you to look and plead and continue to search for more of the Holy Spirit in your life. Ask God to be filled. Rejoice at the glory of God in the last days that we occupy. Let Pentecost stir in you a longing for more of Christ. I mean, he was the one preached by this sermon. He was the focus, and so the Spirit will focus you upon Jesus, and that is indeed our great focus as well. But may we be further clothed in the presence of God and look more to Christ, look more like Christ, and may his gospel go out in power. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we come before you in Christ. And this is our desire, Lord, as a church, that we would have enablement, that we would have more of your spirit. I feel as Moses, God, and I pray you'd strike my brothers and sisters with the same desire that of all the things we've seen you done, our final desire is that you would but pass us by. Pass us by and show us your glory. We're a thirsty land, Lord, and you are the one that has said you will pour out rain from heaven. And so pour, Lord, to the glory of your name. It's in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.